Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're on the issue of annihilationism. So we're looking at this teaching and uh, we're looking at, we've, we've been looking uh, principally at the moment, uh, Edward Fudge, who's one of the main proponents of annihilationism and we've been showing that uh, it, it's on weak grounds and um, yeah, so my website is jasonburnspreacher.com uh, and uh, you can get me on Twitter and Facebook. So I, I listened to a lecture uh, by Edward Fudge. I also then listened to a debate with Edward Fudge and Dr. John uh, McKinley. And um, in that debate, Um, McKinley uh, makes a point if you go to uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 9 2 Thessalonians 1 9 so we'll just look at some of the arguments that so McKinley brings against Fudge, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So here the idea is that people are pushed out of the presence of God doesn't necessarily mean annihilationism there, that they're pushed out of the presence of God. Uh, McKinley points out that uh, worms and fire forever don't make sense in terms of annihilationism. He talks about pain, that they're grinding their teeth, people are grinding their teeth on Judgment Day. And then he uses uh, Matthew uh, 25, 46, which, uh, if we go to Matthew 25, 46, this is for the traditional view. 25, 46, and they shall go away into everlasting punishment, so hell is a punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. And then uh, if you go to Revelation 19, 20, Uh, Revelation 19.20 It says that the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and then that worshipped the image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that had sat upon the horse which the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So there it talks about, uh, and the beast were taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them and received the mark of the beast, then were worshipped, and these both were cast alive into the lake of the burning fire with brimstone, and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So there's a, a casting into the fire there, but let's look at Revelation 20.10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake, fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. So that's very clear. That when it was talking before in John, uh, Revelation 19 that this is an eternal punishment. Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So again, that's very, very clear that people will be tormented forever. In the judgment there. Uh, verse 
Fudge responds in his debate and mentions in Acts 17, Acts 24 and Acts 23, these are only three parts that mention judgment by Paul. That if hell was so important, why is it in the book of Acts? It's not mentioned much. It's interesting though, it's interesting though, that Paul is speaking to Greek speaking people. And so they would know the doct a doctrine of hell in the Greek world. So they wouldn't have had to say it as clearly. They talked about a doctrine of judgment. Um, I listened to a debate uh, between Phil Fernandez and Chris Dirt. Chris Dirt is a formidable debater. Um, he asked this question in his debates. Uh, is man naturally immortal? As if this is a big issue. The other thing as well, the annihilationists say, is that um, the annihilationists will say that the early church took on uh, Platonism, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Platonism says that the soul has been eternal forever. Uh, Christianity never teaches that. The early church fathers never taught that. Uh, the early church fathers and every, every Christian believes that a, you know the the body and the soul had a beginning, all right. Whereas Platonism believed the soul never had a begin, uh, never had a beginning. It was eternal. So there's a difference there, okay. And and, and so it's incorrect to say the early church took on uh, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul through Greek philosophy, and also uh, you know they quote date. And Fudge will quote the early church fathers like Origen and say there wasn't a clear doctrine of hell. Which is, and there was a, 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 there was a, you know, a, a taking on board of the doctrine of the eternality of the soul from Greek philosophy. So they misrepresent the early church fathers. Uh, for example, Tertullian, uh, they would say that he believed in the immortality of the soul because of Greek philosophy. Tertullian was not particularly happy with Greek philosophy and even on the passage of Matthew, 20, Matthew 10, 28 he deduces uh, souls are immortal not in the platonic sense but from a Christian sense that when people die the soul lives on All right? and also he believed in the doctrine of hell so Again, they pick and mix early church fathers and, and, and say that their view was in, during the early church fathers, you know, it wasn't very clear. And they're just muddy in the water, that's not true, it was very clear. And they didn't just mix Greek philosophy and get their ideas. As, um, for example, uh, Jesus dying on a cross was not part of Greek philosophy, but every early church father believed that Jesus died on a cross. So you've got to be careful when the Annihilationists start choose picking and saying things from church history. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the vast majority of early church fathers, 80, 90, 95 percent of them believed in the doctrine of hell, and it's just stretching at language when they take various verses of early church fathers out of context. So you've got to be careful. So, one of the big arguments uh, that the Annihilationists will use um, is Yeah, one of the big arguments that annihilationists will use is Romans 6.28. I think 6. No, Romans 6. 23, sorry. Romans 6.23. They'll say, look, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's look at, uh, this is a commentary by William S. Plummer. And let's see what Plummer 
and other commentators say on Romans 6 28. Okay? So the annihilation is there, you know, it says, By the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? So let's have a look. Great is the grace and rich are the provisions for effecting and compelling the work of salvation. Even they are breaking the bondage of corruption. And now the great the work of purification. The converted man could have no greater work or one that called for the great help from heaven, the perfect holiness. But heaven is a gift, a free gift. Without money, without price, eternal life is deserved by no man. Sorry about this. Right. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Wages, a word found four times in the New Testament. Luke 3.14, John says, The soldiers be content with your wages. Romans uh, 1 Corinthians 9.7, No man goeth a warring at his own charge. 2 Corinthians 11.8, Take wages off them to do your service. It denotes primarily the rations, raiment and hire of soldiers. The Greek word is transferred into the Latin without any change of sound. Yet the Latin word more commonly used was stipendium. Its meaning was well understood in Rome. The idea of dessert, and perhaps that of stipulated reward, is involved in the word here. Nothing is more justly deserved than the rewards of the unrighteous. And no matter has God more faithfully reward forewarned men. Thullock, at the time a man surrenders himself the way of sin, it promises indeed something very different. But while he seeks what is durable, sin deceives him with apparent blessings which prove afterwards to be destruction, his true nature being altogether overlooked in the employment with them. Death, see above, places there referred to the gift of God. He does not say the wages of our good deeds. So we look at verse 21, because he, got, he says, What fruit have you among... Sorry, verse 21. What fruit... Ye then, in those things wherein you are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. Right, verse 21. So let's see what he says about verse 21, about death. What fruit hath ye then, those things wherein you are now ashamed of, for the end of those things is death. Fruit means good fruit, real fruit, profit, solid advantage. They had reaped a great harvest of disappointment, remorse, sorrow, often disease from the wicked courses. Destruction and misery have been in the way of wickedness. They had indeed now repented of them, and the proof of which was found in the fact that they were heartily ashamed of them. Ezekiel 16, 63, 36, 32, uh, chapter 36 and 32, verse 32. But they ought not to forget the unprofitableness of their former course, lest they be tempted to return to say of to any of them, and especially lest they should slight the distinguished privilege they enjoyed under the gospel. Calvin, the godly, as soon as they begin to be illuminated by the spirit of Christ and the preaching of the gospel, do freely acknowledge their past life, which they have lived without Christ, to have been worthy of condemnation, and so far as they form uh, the endeavouring to excuse it, that on the contrary they feel ashamed of themselves. The end of those things which you once and blushingly practised his death, they are all followed by dire penal consequences, consequences many of which are natural, but are not a whit less penal, because by the constitution of things, God has made them natural. Uh, 
Uh, just go to Romans 1.32. It says, Knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. So I just go Romans one thirty two. Sorry about this. Romans one thirty two. Well, we didn't get a lot out of that one. Sorry about that. But what, what, what was interesting there, he didn't mention anything about annihilationism. Um, so let's go back to Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But if you read Romans 6, what shall we then sell, say? Verse 1, shall sin continue in, in sin? It's continuing sin that grace may abound. God forbid, how shall we, shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us are were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we were planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Let's not, so look at that. Knowing this, that the, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So there it's talking about the the body was destroyed but obviously it's not destroyed because uh, Christ died and rose again but it, it's destroyed in, in the act of condemnation there's no longer any condemnation upon us because Christ died for us and rose again so the power of sin has been destroyed knowing this that our, our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin so for he that is dead is freed from sin now if we be dead with Christ we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ being raised from the dead death no more Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto one sin. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as, prim, as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin? Because we are under the law, but under grace, God forbid. Know you not that to whom you obey yourselves, servants it to obey, this servant you are to him. You obey whether you sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. But God is be thanked, that you that you were servants of sin, but you are you have observed from the heart the form of doctrine which you believed you delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servant of righteousness. I think after that manner men became of the infirmity of your flesh, for you have yielded your members servants of uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now you yield your members servants of righteousness. For when we were servants of sin, you were free from the righteousness. 
What fruit then have you in those things wherein you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So I think, to be fair to the annihilationists, there, there, there is a strong emphasis on the physical death, the physical death uh, of punishment. I do think there is um, within that the idea of spiritual death. Okay, but here I think the analogy is on the physical. So when they say for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, there seems to be strong emphasis on physical death and, and eternal life. But getting Paul Paul's theology in context, if we go to Romans 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation, etc. For when we were enemies, we, verse 10, we, reconciled, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement. Wherefore, by one man's sin entered the world, and death by sin, and death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them, that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offence also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be, be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, that abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. For one by, for by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace under the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came unto all men, to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of the free gift came unto all men unto justification of life for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one many became righteous so reading that what we get there in Romans 5 is that death is a spiritual and a physical thing because it's saying there in Romans 5 there was death but there was sin was brought in there was condemnation condemnation sin and death so when death is used, it's in context of three things, death, sin, and condemnation. So in Romans 6, when it says the wages of sin is death, it's in the context of death, condemnation, and sin. In other words, physical and spiritual. So looking at exegetically, looking at Romans 6, and then looking at Romans 5, Romans 5 is behind Romans 6. So, if we go to Ephesians chapter 3, just to prove the point, Ephesians chapter 2, just to round this on, prove this point. And you are the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. When as time passed, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the earth, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So, and you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And that deadness was not just on the way to die, but there was a deadness, spiritually speaking, in the nature of man. So what we conclude there is when in Romans 6 it says the wages of sin is death, it does mean, it has a strong emphasis on the physical death, but it also within that is the idea of spiritual death. So it doesn't necessarily mean to be taken literally as annihilationism, okay? 
So we'll, we'll call it a day on that one, and then we're going to, I think we'll go into the next video and uh, look at, uh, fine, we'll try to wrap it up in the next video, okay? It's a long excursion there, but I had to be faithful. We've got to be intellectually honest and we've got to be fair. We can't straw men people and we have to look at things honestly. So I think I looked at things honestly there. Uh, I think we saw that the annihilationist does seem to have an argument. But then when we look at the wider context of Romans and then we look at Paul's other epistle like Ephesians, there is this element of spiritual death as well as physical death. So you can't just blanketly say we're annihilated. There is the spiritual aspect as well. Um, okay. So that's a long video. <laughs> All right. God bless you. Love to everybody. And um, we'll continue the video series. God bless you. Love to everybody.